Welcome to another Megan Spotlight episode to which we've invited the wonderful team at iLabs, the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences of the University of Washington. iLabs is a center dedicated to discovering the fundamental principles of human learning with a special emphasis on early learning and brain development. We will hear more about this during our upcoming discussions. For Megan, iLabs has been a long-term partner to evolve the MEG field and we have established a strategic research partnership between both parties. The idea behind this collaborate, collaboration is to enable both organizations to further support our devices, software, and hardware developments resulting from research and projects conducted by iLabs, an integral part of Megan's research and product development roadmap. So let's welcome the iLabs team. Patricia Kuhl, the co-director of iLabs. We have Samu Tauru, associate professor, as well as Christina Zhao, research scientist who will discuss how Meg aids the team to conduct brain research on infants and young children. Quite a gigantic device for infants and young children. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, Hello. Pat, uh, we are curious, why was it important for iLabs to partner with Megan? Well, this partnership is really important to the future of our work. Uh, as you said, we're an institute devoted to the development of the brain in young children. And this is a cutting edge question for all of neuroscience. There's quite a bit of work done on the adult brain, but very little work done on the developing brain. And it's not only a cutting edge question in neuroscience, but it's also important to uh, our ability to create uh, possibilities for children who have developmental disabilities. Understanding the mechanisms that drive learning and how the environment and genetics interplay to shape brain development requires a very sophisticated um, imaging situation that really allows us to get at the structures in the brain and how they're activated by various stimuli. So when you think about what brain imaging does for us, there are studies uh, already published from our group that illustrate quite clearly why you need brain imaging uh, and you can't uh, learn the same thing with just behavioral studies. Uh, in 2014, we published a study, for example, showing that when very young babies, six-monthers to 12-monthers, listen to speech, it's not only their auditory cortex that's activated, but the motor systems that will eventually allow them to talk back are activated as soon as the child listens to, uh, to language. And so that's a question that you could not have answered with behavior. So brain imaging studies are really going to carve uh, a new future for our understanding of the brain. And when you look at the possibilities for brain imaging, um, MEG is just the, uh, the method of choice. If you compare it to fMRI, uh, which has spatial resolution capabilities, but no temporal resolution skill, you, know, you can't get at the microsecond uh, changes in the brain, um, and it's noisy. Whereas MEG is basically silent, uh, you have good spatial resolution, you have fantastic fantastic temporal resolution. So if you're really interested in mechanisms, really interested in how the brain works, this is where you're going to land. So uh, we made that decision in 2010 with our first MEG machine. And of course, we are tremendously excited to understand that you are now building our uh, second MEG machine for iLabs and that it will be installed uh, right around the first of 2021. So we have a lot to look forward to. That's great, thank you. Uh, Sam, we can imagine that um, brain activity is difficult to measure in infants, so how does the use of MEG solve that problem? Well, MEG has several practical and methodological advantages, like, um, for example, it's very obvious to us that infants don't like long and uh, difficult measurement setups. And the setup of MEG measurements is uh, very, it's quick and it's straightforward. Also, the actual measurement of the magnetic fields of the brain, it's, um, it's safe, uh, it's comfortable, it can even be fun. Um, and um, on the more methodological side, one, practic one particular aspect in infants is that their so-called electric conductivity profile is changing very rapidly during the early ages of life, which is very problematic, for example, for EEG, uh, which does have the same temporal resolution as MEG, but MEG is less affected uh, by those changes in the conductivity profile. So that's a very big advantage for MEG. And also, I would like to mention that across all these measurement modalities, um, 
we have the common problem of head motion that causes signal distortions. And uh, we do not want to restrict the infants during the measurement. So we actually like to allow them a certain amount of head movement so that they can feel comfortable. And we have very robust um, head movement um, correction methods uh, that work really well. And so our measurements are very robust. Uh, also, it is quite unfeasible to get high quality MRIs from every single uh, individual, especially as a, like a, a, every month of the first year or so, which might be required for very uh, precise um, determination of the connectivity profile and that kind of things. So also in that case, MHC is quite uh, insensitive to that, uh, uh, that uh, challenge. So these are some of the methodological reasons why MHC really is the method of choice for infants. Thank you. Um, it would be interesting to know what other MEG studies you plan or are underway with infants. Well, we have a lot of studies uh, in the domain of language. Uh, we've published quite a bit on phonetic perception. The first learning that babies do is about the sounds that their languages contain and use. Uh, but we've now done studies on initial word learning in 14 monthers, and that's in the publication pipeline. And quite a few studies on the bilingual processing. So in babies at 11 months who are either being raised in a bilingual family as opposed to a monolingual family, family and demonstrating the infant brain's ability to uh, handle both of those languages. And that's a fascinating set of studies that we have already published on. Uh, but we've got new studies going on that explore the world of touch, the effect of touch on the baby brain and looking at the body map in the baby brain and how that's related both to social processing eventually and the kind of understanding that when babies use their body to cognitively uh, understand the world. So that's a relatively new line of work that's published. Uh, it, preliminary findings are published, but uh, that's going to be a sleeve of work that we're going to be very excited about. And uh, we're really happy about the work that Dr. Christina Zhao has done uh, using music as a stimulus, because that has produced some surprises about the effects of music experience on the baby brain. So maybe Christina will tell us a bit about that. Well, thank you, Pat. Um, so as uh, following Pat's and Samu's point, um, our line of research that looks at how music experience affects the early development of human brain uh, goes hand in hand uh, with the theory, theoretical development, and as well as the MEG method advancement. So our original study that was published in 2016 uh, demonstrated a very important effect of um, early music intervention on infant's brain. And that is we randomly assigned nine-month-old babies uh, into either completing a one-month lab, um, laboratory controlled music intervention versus a control group. And um, these music intervention babies came into the lab and uh, they do musical activities. We synchronize their movements with the musical beats. And while the control group came to the lab for the same amount of time, but just did um, free play. And after a month, we used MEG to measure their ability to both process music rhythm as well as speech rhythm. And um, what we found was that um, this one month experience not only enhanced the infant's ability to process music for them, but also speech for them. More importantly, with the spatial resolution of MEG, we were able to examine the effects at specific cortical regions. So what we found was that the enhancement was not only in the auditory region that you would normally expect, but we also found um, enhancement in the prefrontal regions where um, higher level cognitive skills are normally inferred in these regions, such as um, the ability to switch attention or inhibit. And so we think 
this has um, great implications for future research. And um, now with the more uh, advancement in MEG methods to allow us to look at deeper and earlier sensory encoding of sounds, we are currently diving deeper to look at how uh, music intervention affects these earlier processes and how uh, that's the relations um, is with cortical mechanisms. And investigating these questions will allow us to further understand the more comprehensive picture of how music early in baby's life could affect neural development. That's really fascinating, I have to say. What is the uh, future then of MEG? What can you imagine doing in the future? Well, I mean, we're very focused in our, our studies at the moment on various brain areas. As Christina mentioned, uh, seeing that music affects prefrontal cortex is really interesting. And in my studies on speech, looking at how the motor system is involved in perceptual processes early in development. So these areas have been a primary focus. But now we're interested in the connectome. Of course, we want to see how these areas are connected. So these areas are talking to each other in the brain. So using MEG, either through resting state or other more modern uh, modeling methods to understand the connectivity, the networks that are involved in the infant's processing of complex information, cognitive, uh, social, linguistic information, that's a, a highlight of our future studies. The other thing that we're doing at iLabs, the nice thing about having an institute with many, many different uh, people with, with different skill sets and different training, is we're now very focused on multimodal imaging. So now not only with babies, but with teenagers between the ages of nine and 19, we are using a plethora of, of measurement techniques and combining the data. So it's not only MEG processing that we're looking at, but the MRI data that shows you know, diffusion tensor imaging and even spectroscopy, uh, the myelination that's uh, forming in various areas of the brain. So the connectivity that we can see, the structural measures and functional measures we can do with MRI combined with MEG and then combined with genetics gives us an incredibly powerful tool, a real arsenal of approaches to understanding development. So if you're an institute interested in really unpacking the mechanisms that are responsible for human development in all of its diversity, you know, look at the individual differences. We want to apply all of these techniques with MEG as the kind of uh, piece de resistance that really leads the pack of, of measures that we take. But the integration will uh, take us down very exciting new paths. So Samu, what does the future of technology look like? Well, I expect to see very exciting new developments, both in um, MEG instrumentation and also in method development, like mathematical method development. For example, um, now uh, we have this um, a lot of development in the so-called optically pumped magnetometer, magnet, optically pumped magnetometer sensors that we can actually attach to the head, so we, we get much closer to the head, and also we are getting better at understanding the optimal geom geometry of how this um, whole head array should be uh, arranged, where the sensor should be uh, uh, placed, and how we get the best possible information out of the magnetic field. And um, also, for example, in network analysis, which Pat already mentioned, we are seeing new developments in, in the mathematics of, of these um, algorithms, for example, in uh, novel machine learning methods and also many other kinds of pattern recognition and things like that. So the network analysis has been very difficult, uh, even in adults, not to mention infants. And I, I strongly believe that with the new kinds of um, advances in instrumentation, but also in the mathematical modeling alone, uh, we will get much better at uh, revealing the, like the, the, the full network of the uh, brain functions, which is the ultimate goal. Um, and we have already done some interesting work in, in um, extracting signals from deep brain structures here at iLabs. So if we can combine these uh, 
with the more traditional uh, cortical analysis, uh, we will see some very exciting results in the near future on, on how the brain works as a whole. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time today and to answer all our questions and explaining this incredibly interesting work to us and, and our audience. Um, I'm, I know Megan is very excited to, uh, to do the delivery in, in, uh, next year of, our, of your second machine and, uh, and I hope we uh, get to find out how it all works uh, in, our, in another spotlight perhaps. Thank you so much. Thank you.